Hey guys. Okay, so it's been almost forever since I've done a Working With Power Tools uh, episode, which is uh, my rendition a video blog series of uh, behind the uh, scenes look of the development of Urban Terror Resurgence on the Unreal 4. Uh, well, I should say, actually say the porting of Unreal, of Urban Terror, because it's been a game out since uh, 2000, uh, 2001 at least. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're not officially saying we're 20 years old yet, but we're getting pretty close to it at any rate. So, uh, um, reason being, of course, is a lot of uh, R&D has gone into getting into the, um, uh, to uh, the position that we are now, where I would say that we've finally uh, managed to reach the, uh, a cornerstone um, uh, uh, moment in the development of the animation system. Uh, as to being able to uh, just make stuff animation wise for resurgence put them over into unreal 4 and then have stuff that's there that's already wired up and ready to go and plug it in and uh, and then uh, iterate the hell out of it to get the uh, the perfect solution so what we have here is probably the single most important uh, take um, well actually that's not it <laughs> That's something else. Um, where are you? Uh, there we are. The um, the rifle idle stand is perhaps the most important uh, animation take in, in Resurgence history as far as animation goes because everything that's come before it or after it is connected to directly to it and falls down to this basic setup as to position it's a relative in 3D space. If I hit the go button got some animation on it and you can see it move around and it's looking pretty good it's, it's, it's a, a really solid stance um, and uh, so uh, moving on and moving forward the level of importance is now to uh, take all the rules that we've kind of come up with as far as how things have to be staged properly so that when they go in the uh, uh, go into uh, into Unreal 4 everything just kind of flows together and it has a natural connectivity to it rather than just grabbing animation take off the shelf throwing it into the engine and keeping your finger crossed that it works if it doesn't work then you got to iterate the animation blah 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 etc etc so in, in essence if you were to basically take your hands off the keyboard and uh, it, everything falls back to the lowest uh, animation take uh, within the uh, migration pathway this is what you would get and from this point it establishes the uh, everything else that's uh, that's uh, that we need to do moving forward based on the rules that I've just mentioned now um, just to kind of go back a little bit, uh, we have decided to uh, license the uh, use of the uh, of the Genesis 3 framework, not necessarily the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work, the uh, art assets. We don't need the geometry because we're making our own, of course, uh, but uh, everything's being done through injectors using uh, ZBrush, so we can make it, you know, if we want to make a werewolf, we can make a werewolf. If we want to make uh, a mermaid, we can do that. And everything just gets injected into the same pathway. So at this stage, um, moving forward, uh, uh, all we would really need as far as un Unreal 4 goes is some sort of more ability to create a pipeline into Unreal 4 where we can start adding uh, these targeted uh, injectors who create any kind of character that we wish. And we have the uh, animation framework as in this example in front of you that uh, uh, that anything that we apply to this just naturally just uh, um, migrates through the uh, the framework system that we set up for it so we have uh, basically invented a means to uh, to create a virtually hundreds uh, well basically an infinite amount of uh, different types of actors um, based on design and not uh, this is uh, you know and we never have and never will be using uh, push button technology where everything is uh, ultimately we would be hand built now the problem with that is it does take time to build stuff so um, you know we, you start building based on proxy so what's different with this particular scene setup uh, has a lot of key features that uh, is going to derive 
everything forward based on the idea that uh, we are dealing with unique and individual weapons um, and not necessarily the characters. That's the uh, driving force behind the animation itself. It depends on what weapon that the, the player is currently possessing has to has to direct uh, the, the traffic as to what kind of animations they need to be applied uh, specifically for the operation of that uh, particular uh, item. So in this case, the default is in the, uh, is the uh, is the uh, this beautiful LR that uh, that has been built and uh, iterated over time and is currently in the game and it's, uh, it has this nice little you know it's a little bit bigger in scale but it uh, it looks it looks awesome it uh, it has a, 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 it has a high you know, it's easy to read across the map. You know, it's the old uh, trick, movie trick. You know, you make your weapon slightly larger than uh, the real life counterpart because it always reads better on uh, on the big screen. You know, it looks nasty. You know, it's just it's the same as sound effects. You know, in the movies, it does. You know, not, you know, you got these uh, weapons that are, are louder, more vicious than they actually are. When in real life, they sound more like a pop gun. And they don't have that uh, viciousness that we're looking for. Now, um, from a completed standpoint, I'm still iterating this uh, key pose uh, based, uh, as I mentioned, on some basic rules that need to be applied to what would be considered a, a urban terror player model. And one of the demands uh, is that uh, the player has to always be aiming in the direction that the uh that they're they're well either they're shooting or they're looking uh for the mere fact that this is what a lot of tactics are based off of or keyed off of is they're not looking at the eyes to see if they're being you know somebody sees them but rather the the uh, weapon itself becomes a big huge finger pointing at them which then makes them realize that hey this guy's looking at me he's actually coming my direction you know he's not just going <coughs> walking by duh, 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 duh. uh no <laughs> ignoring the world so um uh, like it or not you cannot use a relaxed positioning you cannot uh Give that sense of uh, real-world combat that you might experience in uh, in those uh, other types of simulations and, and what have you, um, as uh, it always has to be kind of in this kind of a aggressive stance. Uh, that's not to say we can't have a little bit of fun with this, because even though it is a it is the key idle state, so you know if the player stops, this is what you see. Uh, variations can be added to the uh, to to the stock animations that uh, are being played so we're not limited to just one idle state we can uh, very we, we can mix things up uh, uh, creating uh, uh, various different types of uh, idle states that uh, that could be um, put in at random so if we have say uh, a selection of 10 different uh, idle states as being animated over a course of 100 frames we can play each of those at a random at a random occurrences and it could be uh, either anything that's context sensitive uh, you know just to add some variation so the player is not just standing there playing the same cycle over and over and over again so we can have some various different uh, variations uh, for example um, one of the things that uh, I do <laughs> I really don't like it is when players go AFK and they just stand there in the world environment as opposed to doing the smart thing and that's to leave the battlefield and head towards a spectator mode or just log back in at a later date. So they leave their player on the field expecting that you know that those who are on the who are playing the game will actually respect the fact that they are AFK going to the bathroom or having dinner or answering the door and that they'd uh, uh, kind of not frag them. It's even been suggested by some uh, that uh, they should have an AFK bubble over their head. And uh, my my uh, you know my uh, attitude towards that is it's just uh, <laughs> all they're doing is uh, is they're just creating a target for me to shoot at. I mean, to me, somebody goes AFK, don't get off the field. They're free points. I'm gonna you know they're gonna come back and they're gonna see that uh, I've racked up ten points. Uh, fragging their ass because they decided to uh, to uh, you know not not leave the field when they should you know 
the game's just too fast to make decisions that uh, if you wanted to be, a, even if you wanted to be a nice guy, you see the guy, you shoot him, right? That's how fast this game plays out. You don't take time and say, oh, well, I wonder if this guy's AFK. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. So I'm thinking, hey, you know, it'd be fun to do my thing. So if the guy goes AFK for a certain period of time, that uh, the that the actual play model will actually take over the game itself and do things like, for example, hold up a sign that says, hey, I'm AFK, frag me, or <laughs> pull out a lawn chair, sit down, start reading a newspaper. So, you know, if they don't want to leave the field, then that's uh, that's their own fault. That That's the name of this game. You know, they should not be given any kind of consideration whatsoever if they're just not into it. They're not they don't have their hands on and they're playing the game okay so we i've talked a little bit about rules so what does our character have to follow rules um what are they well i'd mentioned one in that the the weapon of choice the one that they're currently loaded out with has to always point in the direction that the player is looking so uh uh the way this is set up and the way i have it set up is that uh, all these animation takes are are um, put in so far are focusing on the, the uh, crouching ability of the player so I can just skip from one uh, take to another all within the same file and make everything match up uh, to uh, extend that I've taken some of the weapons that we that are currently um, FS branded, meaning that uh, we owned uh, full rights to it, we built it, we made it, we textured it, and we gave it a lot of loving. Um, I have already stacked up uh, as to our current um, going into testing uh, loadout, so I can uh, just simply change the weapon um, and just correct the hand quickly change the hand positioning of the character and then all of, then those changes are are translated through the entire uh, database for this particular uh, state uh, of animation required so we're adding uh, uh into this file like if i go to the to the 1911 which we code name we give we give all uh all our weapons uh, code names that are different from what they are in real life due to, uh, of course, copyright concerns. But uh, yeah, for most people, the, you know, an LR is an LR. So what? Mm. Excuse me. So if I wanted to, t so as I mentioned, everything is uh, weapon specific, uh, and then I save the file out as a single a single package, and then uh, export everything out, out that is required, you know, the reloads, the equipped, or anything that is involving that to make that weapon work properly uh, based on a unique frame style. And then everything at some point just goes out in bulk form. So, you know, we uh, add a new weapon to the loadout. I toss it onto, uh, onto our uh, base character here for the specific uh, set and uh, just adjust everything. Uh, do a little bit of uh, a little bit of um, <coughs> um, uh, what you might call it um, constraint work to to keep that weapon move, aiming forward. Now, what do I mean by aiming forward? You can see that the uh, there's there's our weapon. It is uh, it is in it's in line both vertically and horizontally as well as laterally as to being centered and so when the head is uh, adjusted and, and looking down down the pipe so to speak then the, the, there's definitely a, the, the direction the player is going to be moving is the direction which the uh, once the um, once the aim offsets are added that's where that wherever it's playing that's where the, p the player is looking now to kind of Juice that up a bit. So if you're looking at the the player, they're gonna say, well, you know, the player's not really looking down <laughs> down the line, but in actuality, that's once again the nature of the setup is everything is ready to be able to conform to whatever we need the the, the, the particular uniqueness of a player to do. Um, so in this case, for example, um, I have uh, attached to the a character face. And I'm using cluster shaping. I'll talk a little bit about cluster shaping in just a minute. <coughs> and those cluster shapings have would have I can make, or I have uh, some of the basic uh, requirements for a character. So 
It doesn't need any anything fancy. Now, why morphs over? Uh, why clustering over morph targets? Like morph targets is has uh, extreme high fidelity to it, and that <coughs> it's uh, you can literally make a, a, a uncanny valley act actor um, be so photorealistic that it'd be difficult to tell it from the real deal. <coughs> But we don't need that level of fidelity for a game called Urban Terror. So, but we still do need uh, the ability to, um, you know, expand down the road. So, um, although the ba the ability to do almost anything action-wise or mobility-wise has uh, now been kind of completed, um, we still want to be able to uh, have a pipeline for something that we might may or may not want to do, say, five years down the road. So uh, that's the uh, that's just what you get when you make use of the uh, Genesis 3 framework. Is that all that stuff is there for you? You don't want a car with a cigarette cigarette lighter into it. You just get it anyways, because you, even though you have no use for it. So um, in this case, uh, cluster shaping is already kind of you know is already available. All you have to do is create the cluster shapes. And uh, the other benefit, of course, is it's just it's just translation data. So it goes out of uh, any application that you're using for animation um, as data without the need for supporting morph targets. So you keep the, uh, the storage uh, requirements down to uh, to the as minimum as it can be, <coughs> and uh, and it's uh, you know it's um, not as good as uh, morph targets, but uh, the other end of the scale, it's actually quite adequate and uh, superior to some of the AAA stuff that I've seen uh, as of late. That uh, this could uh, obviously fill the, the, that need uh, across a broader range of different characters because you know clusters on one character is the same position and relative position from one to the other. So uh, you just reusing, you can just reuse the animation over and over again. So for example. We we're going well, you know. We're not looking down down the pipe, so I can go to my uh, you know my with the uh, with my character face activated. I can actually just keyframe the, the proper eye position to account for looking down down <laughs> down the, the the way. So there we have our character looking down at in the direction of the whatever uh, the. He, she he or it or whatever is actually aiming at so this is this is a bonus this is comes with it so i can also create expression sets for a particular type of uh type of uh, uh situations okay thank you um so for example um we can create an angry for for this aiming sequence this would have to be applied to the aim offset, of course, but uh, this is a good, good enough to illustrate how how we can. So we're looking at. So she's looking at you, and she's angry. Uh, we also have things like that that could be reactive uh, based on contact. So, for example, um, a portal character here. Actually, I'm still stuck on angry. Where are you, angry? No, we got eyes up. No, everything's been zeroed out. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> change the eye line and you have a totally different type of uh, visual effect okay where is pain there's pain so uh she gets shot boom ah ah <laughs> so that's a those types of things can be added uh, of course um as um as a, a procedural uh, effect in in the game and during runtime, and clustering uh, allows it to, uh, you know, you you just need one solution, one pane for all the characters, so you don't have to be making anything unique for a particular character based on the use of uh, uh, morph targets. <coughs> it just keeps everything nice and neat and tidy. Okay, so moving on, moving forward, another option, of course, is that. Uh, and something that we really don't have uh, a use for right now, it really is uh, the ability to add uh, acting ability to our character. So if I hit the go button, death before dishonor. You can see I have a little bit of speech. death before dishonor. You know, just a sound sample I stole from one of my one of my packages that I have. 
what I can do though is with Motion Builder, if you're familiar with it, it has a uh, has a, it works on what's called device. Now, one of the most uh, prominent devices at the moment for Motion Builder, of course, is Live Link, which is just another device you can throw it into the scene, and it's quite easy to hook up and boom, out whatever is being seen on the screen here is conveyed over to Unreal 4 and uh, hopefully in the future it'll be adjusted so that you can actually start recording takes across and do all sorts of wonderful thing which I assume is on its way but in this case for example with the with the device hooked up there's our voice device I'm gonna set it to live and we're already online and I've got my um, my my device here set up with a sound sample now this device called the voice device takes audio input and converts it to uh, either morph or cluster data output based on uh, based on relationship constraint in other words we just have to tell what bone is being used for what and of course because it's got clustering and it also supports morphs it's uh, also this is the base once again if we're going to hook up a um, any kind of motion capture device because it uh, can quite easily accept motion capture information from any device many di different devices because well that's what uh, motion builder is designed to do so if we go live with our uh, with our thing turned on here death, death before, before dishonor, dishonor. Yeah, death before, before dishonor <clears throat> death before dishonor I wonder if I can actually change the facial shape. Death before dishonor. Can it? Okay, we'll just... Death before we'll, dishonor. We'll just try it. If it doesn't work for me, then we're going to just have to kind of... Death before There's our relationship dishonor. constraint. But if we go down to where angry is... Death before dishonor. Imagine having to listen to that over and over and over Death again. before where dishonor. Is angry is angry is at the top there. Okay, so... Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. So, uh, so in uh, Unreal Death 4, before dishonor. we can uh, sort of tag uh, the different uh, radio calls. Death with before dishonor. <coughs> Enough of you. I know, death before dishonor. Okay, so uh, in Unreal 4, of course, we can just uh, we can tag whatever radio call with whatever emotion state, emotional state it needs to to uh, purvey and then just the uh, clustering of course just a it becomes um, an additive type of animation this is additive stuff that's being applied to it in real time so to speak you know in well to the point that i'm actually hitting the go death button. before dishonor so if i have live link hooked up and show this is what death will show before up. dishonor so we can start creating all death sorts of different dishonor. facial shapes you know, you give me a 10, 10 minute soliloquy, I can plug that in and uh, and just in real time, actually. Let's see if it'll Death work. before dishonor. As long as the, Death before dishonor. the expression shape is not driven, I can actually Death before dishonor. mix shapes. Death before dishonor. Death before dishonor. So I can actually kind of get the kind of shaping that I Death want before uh, just by moving dials and what have you. So that's Death uh, before dishonor. That's not something that I've worked too hard about uh, over implementing because once again, it's just there. Everything I need to be able to hook this up and what have you, and then move it over into Unreal Four, is actually part of the framework to begin with. It's just all that work to be able to uh, conform it to. Another side level project that I'm working on is converting uh, some of the more uh, procedural some of the uh, some of the skin uh, material texturing and what have you that comes with the digital human the eyeballs the uh, you know I, I figured out how to remap the uh, the, the g3 in in uh, uh, different characters in uh, in unreal 4 that uh, you can use the uh, epics uh, eyeball uh, materials that come with uh, with um, with uh, 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 what you call it? That game they give this give that stuff that just give. Away. It's going to hit me in just a moment, so we'll just move on. So the cool thing about that is, you know, eyes are eyes, and uh, you know, 
dealing from Paragon assets, uh, different colors of an instance of that material. Uh, you know, all our eyeball work uh, as far as texturing goes is done. It's uh, not too difficult to uh, uh, remap and uh, just reuse uh, and make their uh, materials conform to this given character. Uh, subsurface materials like skin and what have you, I've been kind of experimenting with that too as well. Uh, so I could uh, land up ultimately with one material to serve them all because uh, being a Genesis 3 framework, the, the UV mapping doesn't change. It reconfigures. If we use an, a morph injector, it just it just uh, adjusts to whatever character that you're applying it to. Um, but uh, in in a lot of ways, the you know it's just nice. That it would be nice to have uh, a one skin uh, works with all because once again, it's framework. You know um, the uh, whatever character that we make, the UV mapping is still the same. So you're just you're just repainting the same mapping over and over and over again with different texturing and so forth. So I've been kind of experimenting with that, trying to get uh, actually I'm kind of into the uh, Weta uh, original Weta uh, um, uh, documentary I saw way back when, where they were just applying the different types of skin materials to Gollum. And they land up with gigabytes of sorts of materials, and it's actually a pretty cool idea. Just layering one skin texture under another, under another. You know, you would have a normal map layer, a specular layer, and uh, you know, a subsurface layer, and then an, uh, a defect layer, and then, an, and then a skin tone layer, and then another layer on top of that. So you could have uh, <coughs> um, for a video game character, it'd be a pretty heavy load, but uh, it's something to consider. Um, and of course, somewhere down the line, somebody will eventually come up with uh, a video game usable um, base material for the Genesis uh, Genesis framework. And all probability Genesis 8, because we're constantly moving forward with that kind of stuff. Okay, so um, other rules to kind of cover here is, uh, is uh, first of all, uh, as we uh, talked about, our weapon is facing the uh, forward horizontal and vertical and keeping the line another uh, rec uh, rule is left foot forward always uh, in any when given the option or the ability and the foot is actually fixed in place like I have uh, the ability to just select the foot and create a effector on that foot and this effector basically locks that foot in place so when I flip from one uh, base animation to another it's like I'm going from a standing to a crouching I have uh, an a two animations one going down one going up and the feet are planted in the same position the same thing when with, with for player turn animations I'm just not throwing a turn animation onto it the uh, animations have to be m matched up with the foot position which uh, which um, you now the other yeah just throwing an in, an in place animation does it does work but you're asking, in all probability, to the animation to make a, um, a much more stretched out uh, blend between one shape and the other. If it doesn't start out on the on a particular set foot position to begin with, uh, same thing for stops and starts. We want to start out and stop stop uh, based on a the uh, the uh, one pose to rule them all. Uh, uh, you know, this could be any kind of. Uh, pose like if we were uh, making a, a, a game with uh, mages and uh, rangers and what have you then we might want to change our, our key uh, obviously our key um, idle state but following the rules here just uh, we're going to have this kind of uh, really strong idle uh, position which would not obviously be normal in most uh, most accurate type of uh, war games type of uh, games uh, another thing is markers that uh, I put up. Um, this marker over, here. this marker here determines the vertical and hor the the lateral uh, forward and uh, side to side position of the hip, uh, which would be relative to the castle. Now, best practice wise, you should always try to keep your your hips orientated to uh, zero zero as well to the position of our marker here. The uh, reason being is that, uh, of course, is the uh, capsule, the movement component turns, 
your pin to the pivot point of that capsule has to be centered to the capsule itself. So if we actually do um, uh, uh, animation that uh, where the uh, like in the crouch position, it's going to get a little bit uh, chunky because uh, we're a little bit. We would have to actually pull, you know, to line things up a little bit. We'd have to have a, the hips a little bit more towards center. So that this type of stuff becomes a little bit more critical about making decisions of where the hips are located. If we go outside the pivot point with the hips, what happens is you have this big, huge butt kind of swinging around like a baseball bat, as opposed to having that really nice vertical line where if the player turns, it's pivoting from the hips where it should, as opposed to the feet connected to the uh, to the to the box. This uh, next uh, marker here is at 98 units off the ground which corresponds exactly to to um, to the crouch idle position and height let's clear off the effectors so you can kind of see where the left foot is forward and planted okay so our marker here as you can see is roughly the height of the head as a point of reference now this is actually m referencing more world space rather than the actual eye line of where the player is and relative to the castle in the crouch position <coughs> the reason for this is that uh, you want to keep the head at a certain height uh, particularly when you're in the crouch position otherwise you'll have a situation where where the where the third person player is actually higher or lower than the actual camera position of the third person of the first person um, camera and of course that means that uh, you won't be able to see over the edge but the player on the other side can see your head from the position that they are because they're if they're standing they're elevated so you get a perspective type of uh, differential between the two so you can be behind a wall uh, based uh, on the idea that hey if he can't see me if I can't see him, he can't see me, which is not the case in, mo in most situations because it's perspective orientated uh, to the camera. So if I'm standing, I can see you at, so at some point, but you can't see me. Now, the question is, uh, a question that usually pop pop pops up is, uh, you know, well, what if I don't want the other player to see me? You need to have a point of reference. So this point of reference uh, at 98 units exactly what, based on testing is exactly where it's where what you would see relative to another player who's standing at x number of units away so you would see the three from this line all the way to the top of the head and it exactly matches that uh, based on uh, that uh, particular test so um if you want to actually have the player hidden behind the wall then you have to add uh, x number of units to your wall object because that would then bring it up to 108 units off the ground and then you can't see the top of the head anymore so these kind of things you got to kind of test for um, uh, you need to know set value so you can make a design decision and uh, as far, and so that's why I'm working on crouching now is because it's <laughs> it gave me kittens in uh, working on uh, URT it takes three to um, because of the fact that uh, the player controls the hip rotation from the, the silly little tags of the hips and what have you so uh, this is where we're, I'm at where we <laughs> as far as um, uh, you know as I mentioned uh, it's uh, it's an epic moment for me particularly because now I can focus on actually making things that making it matter uh, it's not as I mentioned it's not that what we did before we're, didn't matter it just mattered more towards implementation finding out answering questions and figuring out how things need to be connected before a lot of effort was put into actually dialing in the art asset so um hopefully that was informative uh as to how okay well actually one more thing one more thing that i think <laughs> might be of interesting information is since everything has gone weapons based and I can actually bring in the actual uh, working uh, 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 working asset uh, to answer the question is well how do you how do you go about animating um, animating uh, you know this type of setup where you know the, the player has a weapon the weapon has to fire you have to be able to reload it and everything has to kind of translate 
So, oh, uh, I got one more other thing I want to talk, <laughs> mention before before I close out. So remind me, please. So in the case of weapon uh, animating, everything gets animated within the scene here. So we do a reload. We do everything functionally as far as the weapons is being reloaded and uh, uh, its interaction with it, the clip being pulled out, you know, the pulling of it, uh, the, uh, the bolt back, the firing of the weapon, you know, uh, the port ejecting bullets and stuff out of it. And we basically animate straight ahead uh, based on what you see. Then once we're ready and we're saying, okay, we have, uh, okay, we have uh, our animation for the third person and the third person weapon. Uh, the first person's got a different story. Uh, I'm going to deal, do a separate thing on that later, later down the road because we're still in development on that. And the information that I would pr relate now is, um, once again, is bits and pieces, you know, connecting the dots kind of thing. This is, uh, this is actually... Uh, 99.9% .9 completed as to our design and intentions. So uh, we've uh, basically uh, animated our character, got all this cool reloading cycle, and it's handling the weapon perfectly. It's got the hands on the proper contact points, and we would say, okay, we're done, and we want to export it. Normally, I would just, uh, I would bake, uh, I would just have to bake our character rig, G3 here, down to the base rig with the skeleton, and then export it out and import it in Unreal 4, and we have the animation that uh, matches up with our G3 setup in uh, Unreal 4. Our weapon itself then has to go through a different, slightly different uh, process and pipeline. So if I, uh, where are you, where are you, where are you? Okay, there you are. So to export it, it's, uh, all animations would then be, would be the conform to uh, its local space, meaning that uh, those animation keyframes are actually connected to the, to our uh, our root of our weapon that is connected to our player using a uh, parent-child constraint, so that can be moved anytime I want. So um, I would put that on a separate uh, layer. Uh, well, I don't want that one. I would put that on a separate layer. No, I would not move the animation over because I don't want the player movement to actually affect the uh, the local transform of the character, and then. I would just, uh, since the uh, player, uh, since the weapon model comes in as based on uh, world origin of 000, I go, yeah, okay, there it goes over like that. Uh, with the selected, you probably see all that with the root selected, or yeah, actually, I would probably select all animations as relevant. These are all relevant. You can see I can kind of cheat it. I use the scar uh, uh, <laughs> animation rig. Select that, go over here, go to uh, Motion Export, and then wherever uh, I've stored the uh, base uh, animation as a, as a link to the game, uh, I just export the, the, the data based whatever is done this track over to uh, that folder, and then Unreal 4, I just go re-import onto this, this character rig here, animation rig, and then that gets put into our weapon BP, if it's a reload, then it goes into the reload slot, and then every time the player animation performs with the uh, weapon uh, possessed, that the LR possessed, it then plays the uh, uh, the the it then plays the uh, uh, reload animation on DG3 form uh, verbatim, uh, and then of course with the weapon possessed and lined up with the hand, then it just uh, also channels the animation for the weapon itself. To, to the weapon within that sequence. So I hit reload, um, three things would happen. First of all, three things? No, four things happen. First of all, the first person animation plays the first person reload, which is part of the weapon's blueprint. The weapon at the pos that is possessed by the first person also plays the animation for the weapon within the first person perspective. The third person model plays the animation for the reload, uh, and then Whatever weapon is possessed and connected on the local level is also placed the animation at the same time. So we have three events triggered for the one one event that uh, that is required, and that's basically how you go about connecting your your animation dots, so to speak. The last thing to cover, is, of course, is the first person. Is uh, uh, well, it's really something that shouldn't be mentioned because uh, it's still something that is in development, but it is part. Uh, I, I think part and part of of what we want as our default build 
seen for the particular animations that we're talking about. And that is, let's hopefully we don't get any full frontal nudity. Okay, we can actually go ahead and hide this, I guess. Um, I, so you can actually see the whole body basically through it from toe to nose. So um, now we can slice and dice this up for our particular uh, needs. But uh, uh, I just went ahead and put everything into it because it's cool. And these are our first person hands that coincide with the J3 form. Now, just to kind of hint out how this is going to work down the line at the moment, we're using the uh, epic uh, basic uh, rig with the animation that applied to it for the uh, first person um, animation and needs and character needs and what have you. But ultimately, we want to be able to use uh, you know, assets developed for the first person, third person character model. So those are being, so that's once again the case where, where the stuff is being built. Now at some point it needs to be um, implemented. So until we get to the implementation stage, we need a hole filler so that the coders can still go ahead and can continue working on what, what they're, they're doing and make things functional. So a uh, lot of proxy work. Don't, don't fear the proxy use. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, it's uh, you know, I buy a lot of this stuff just to fill holes. And then, of course, the plan A is always to, to follow up and replace it with something that we made or we have uh, ownership over with, uh, even though we have fair use rights over that kind of stuff. So in this case, I've had the, uh, since we have the use of the G3, I got the G3 arms that uh, as, uh, as hope at some point will become the proxy. Um, and uh, we'll just use injectors to uh, conform those to whatever player that model that we're uh, we're particularly using as well as changing out the material types so uh for example uh we want to at some point put in somebody a, a, a real beefy muscular character you know um the nice thing about uh, a motion builder it uh, it uh, it retargets like a bandit i mean everything and anything that's in this space is retargeted by its very nature so, for example, I'm, I'm retargeting everything to a control rig right now. This control rig can uh, animation to the spine to this. If I had other rigs in here, I can retarget that and it automatically does it to a different character totally. So I could have a, a, a 10 foot beastie that's uh, using the same animation with the same spatial compensation as whatever character I'm working on. So in this case, the uh, first person hands are here that uh, as kind of a reminder and a connection to that pipeline. Where you know, if I want to make a muscular type of character, it can be it still fit the it'll ultimately still fit the uh, animation pipeline uh, once it's connected. So it's once again another case of it's not needed, but we're anticipating that it might be, and it doesn't cost us anything uh, of including it at this time, uh, as opposed to having to um, you know start rebuilding things at a later date is you know um i'm pretty sure poor old blade killer can tell you horror stories about how many times she's had to build rebuild the character models so with the uh inheriting the um taking on or adding the uh, genesis 3 framework to the pipeline uh that will never happen again period because there's you know there's all there's always a way to hang something off of it without having to rebuild stuff there's always a way to Im always to improve that part of the pipeline without affecting the work that other people have already done, um, and uh, it just it's just I don't know how to put it. it everything just sort of conforms to whatever, whatever you need out of it. Um, you know, you need uh, you, you know you get into a, um, say an ugly bend. You can make corrective poses in uh, in Das Studio. Uh, and then channel it out through the uh, G3 pipeline, and you can fix that stuff uh, almost. Uh, you know, you say, hey, this looks lousy. Okay, Dad Studio, bum, 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 Morph Target, bum, 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 bum. Now, if uh, if um, Unreal 4 had a, a Morph Loader, like Dad Studio has a Morph Loader, then you could just reload or, or load in whatever um, additive type of anime, uh, characters that you want. Uh, uh, and if, if we're lucky, maybe someday we'll have a live link uh, set up <laughs> between Dad Studio and Unreal 4. I mean, uh, I would rather have that than the live link to uh, Blender. Now, me and no offense, of course. Okay, um, hopefully that was entertaining, uh, hopefully informative, willing to answer questions about it. This is not top secret stuff. This is, um, 
this is more this is definitely um general uh general information uh, how things are you know one way or another how things can get done and uh and it's not secret sauce uh and uh willing to share this kind of information with anybody that uh, needs a little bit of direction okay thanks guys i uh, hope uh, uh i didn't uh, chatter on too long bye